There is a certain mystery that surrounds the earliest decades of the Christian church. We have very few sources about them, though, relying mainly on the earliest chapters of the book of Acts, some bits and pieces from Paul's letters. Yet we tend to be very nostalgic about the earliest days of the primitive church because this is where, well, technically, this is where Christianity began. Of course, it was not actually Christianity as we know it back then. It was, it was not a new religion, something independent of Judaism, at least not at first. Back then, it was a Messianic Jewish movement, and the disciples of Jesus were Jews. The leaders of the early church were Jews. Even Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, was himself a Jew. Now, we know a little bit about certain key figures in the early church, like Paul or John or Peter, James, and, and, and others as well, like Barnabas and John Mark. But we really only have partial glances or fragmentary insights into who they were, what they did, what they believed, and how they formed the earliest Jesus movement. And importantly, we, we, we have to ask, we're inclined to ask, what did these first Christians, as far back as the Jerusalem church, what did they believe about Jesus? What was the first Christology? Or how did Christology begin? Hi, I'm Mike Bird, and welcome to the Nazareth to Nicaea podcast and vodcast, the show where we look at all things pertaining to the historical Jesus, the Christ of faith, and everything in between. This week, we begin the first of two episodes on the Christology of Jewish Christianity. But what precisely is Jewish Christianity? What do we mean when we talk about Jewish Christianity? Well, Jewishness itself is a very contested category. I mean, how do you define Jewishness in antiquity? For the sake of simplicity, I'll define Jewishness as a mixture of ethnicity and shared custom. And then on the Christian side, you could say it means someone who believes that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah. So Jewish Christianity is nothing more than Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But that category, that title, Jewish Christianity itself can be somewhat problematic because it assumes that Jewishness is a kind of adjective and Christianity is the object in question, as if Christianity is a known and established thing, and Jewishness is merely the, the species or the subtype of Christianity that we are talking about. But that doesn't quite work because we have to remember that in the beginning, Christianity was not a separate religion. It was a movement, a messianic movement within Judaism. It's still part of the Jewish diversity that you find in the first century. So rather than say Jewish Christianity, you could say it makes some sense to talk about Christian Judaism and to refer to Messiah believing Jews or to refer to something even like apostolic Judaism. Now, those are designations that each have their own merits. But for the sake of simplicity, I'll keep referring to Jewish Christians. But a few things I want you to note. These Jewish Christians are a sect or a chapter very much within Judaism. They are part of the diversity of Judaism within the first century. Uh, they also describe themselves using other terms, not so much Christian, but they call themselves followers of the way or Nazarenes or the church, the called out ones in the Greek word ekklesia. Uh, the title Christian, Christianoi, gets introduced later mainly when Gentile adherents begin joining this Jewish Christian group and pagan authorities needed a way to distinguish the normal synagogue attending Jews with this strange messianic chapter that was beginning to recruit some Gentile adherents. And we have to remember as well that all Christianity is Jewish Christianity, at least until about 70 AD. Even the Apostle Paul is himself a Jewish Christian. And Jewish Christians, whether speaking Aramaic or Greek, are still within the orbit of common Judaism. With those Given those qualifications, I would define Jewish Christianity as referring to those Jews who believed in Jesus as the Messiah, 
and continue to follow a Jewish way of life, largely as set out according to the Torah. So Jewish Christians or Christian Jews, what did they believe about Jesus and who did they think he was? That is what we're going to explore in the next two episodes of this podcast and vodcast. There were several things that shaped the conception of Jesus held by the early Jerusalem church. First and foremost has to be the impression that the historical Jesus made upon them. They knew Jesus. They followed Jesus. They experienced Jesus as something of a Galilean holy man. He was a, a prophet, a rabbi, an exorcist, a healer, even a credit as being a miracle worker. Uh, and, and that aspect of Jesus's life and his ministry was never forgotten. In fact, in the book of Acts, you can see Jesus explicitly remembered as a man attested by God with deeds of power, wonders and signs that God did through him. In addition to that, Jesus was also remembered as being a messianic claimant. Now, we've already done a whole separate video on whether Jesus thought he was the Messiah. And we've answered that in the affirmative. Jesus was a messianic claimant. He claimed to be an anointed person who would be on the center stage of Israel's restoration and the advent of the kingdom. The other thing that stands out from the historical Jesus, and I think strongly influenced the memory of him and early conceptions of him, is that Jesus claimed an unusual sense of divine authority. In fact, I think edging into the categories of divine embodiment. I mean, Jesus did not simply proclaim the kingdom of God. He saw himself as the one who was ushering it in. He saw himself both now and in the future as going to be at the center of it. If the coming of the kingdom of God is the coming of God as king, Jesus locates himself as the center, as the, as the fulcrum of God's very kingship. And we can add to that his claimed authority to forgive sins, that responses to him will determine one's fate and the great judgment or the great assize to come. He also claims to teach a certain degree of wisdom, but he also claims to be wisdom. He claims he has a type of wisdom from God that will be vindicated. He even claimed to be greater than the temple. And in some places, he even uses the language of divine visitation to describe his own ministry. Yet all of that should have come to naught because, as we know, Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate sometime around 2930 CE. And that should have demonstrated beyond all doubt that he was not the Messiah. He was not a holy man. If anything, he was a false prophet leading the nation astray. He was a false messiah. He was a usurper. He was someone who was ultimately perhaps a lunatic or just a dangerous sectarian, one of many who popped up from time to time. But soon after his death, his disciples believed that he had been raised by God from the dead. Now, we don't have time to go into the debates about what actually happened, the historicity of the resurrection, or to compare it with other things in other religions. What we can say is that his disciples, his earliest followers, became convinced that his crucifixion was not the end of him, that God had brought him back to life, had resurrected him, and he had then ascended back to the Father. Now, this is quite remarkable. I mean, if they were experiencing grief and if they had some sense of cognitive dissonance, if they wanted to uh, invent a way to kind of spin this to make it look good, they could have said all sorts of things. They could have said that he was a righteous martyr and we should rally around his cause and his name. They could have said that he's his soul has gone back to heaven. They could say that he's now in Sheol, the waiting place of the dead, safely esconded in the bosom of Abraham. They could say he's become a star or anything like that, or he's become an angel. But instead, they declared with great passion and conviction that God had resurrected him. 
Now, that is an exceedingly odd claim because in, in the Jewish worldview, at least for those who believed in resurrection, resurrection was meant to happen at the end of history for everyone. You know, the, the, the righteous, the righteous within Israel or all Israel were going to be resurrected and brought back to life. It was meant to be at the end of history and it was meant to be corporate. And yet the first Christians believed that God had raised one person up in the middle of history. And that had all sorts of ramifications. It meant that Jesus's resurrection was a foretaste or a first installment of the general resurrection. And this is why they use the language of Jesus's resurrection of being something like the first fruits of the resurrection. And they saw Jesus himself as the firstborn from among the dead, the first new human being of God's new world. And resurrection implied something about Jesus. When first of all, it was something of a vindication. It means he wasn't a false prophet leading the nation astray. It means he wasn't a pseudo messiah. It means he wasn't a lunatic. It means, they tell us, he was the son of God, not just an earthly son of David, but the son of God in power. What is more, it seems to have implied that Jesus was, in a sense, divine. He was God. That is why you find in the Eastern narratives, Jesus being worshipped. This is why Thomas meets the risen Jesus and calls him my Lord and my God. This is why Paul in Romans can refer to Jesus as the Messiah, who is God over all. This is why in a Jewish Christian text such as the Didache, it refers to Jesus with an element of praise. And it says not Hosanna to the son of David, but it refers to him saying Hosanna to the God of David. So clearly the resurrection generated a view that Jesus was not just a human figure. He was now a divine being. But what type of divine being? Where was he situated in a heavenly hierarchy? And here there were numerous ways of understanding how divine a divine being was. For example, in Isaiah 9.5, uh, the, the forthcoming Davidic king uh, who follows after Hezekiah, is going to be called Mighty God, or in the Septuagint, uh, the Greek translation of Isaiah, he's called Angel of the Great Council. Or we can go through other messianic literature and look for similar ways of talking about divine or messianic beings. Uh, there's one text from Qumran, uh, 11Q13, where there is a figure of Melchizedek. Now, whether this is a messiah or an angel, it doesn't really matter, but he's described with the language of Psalm 82, and he's called God, Elohim in Hebrew. Or to look at another text from Qumran, the self-exaltation hymn, quite a remarkable text, you have a figure there who's very mysterious. We don't know whether it's an angel, uh, a messiah, a king, maybe some kind of eschatological priest, maybe someone from the Qumran community, but they refer to themselves in, in, in very elevated language, in divine language. I mean, saying that they are destined to sit in the throne in the heavenly council. I mean, the person, the speaker in that text says, I am counted among the gods and my dwelling is in the holy congregation. My desire is not according to the flesh, but all that is precious to me is in the glory of the holy dwelling. That's a very exalted claim to make about yourself or to make about even someone else. Or maybe Jesus was divine in the sense of being a patriarch who'd been taken up into heaven. And, and we have Jewish literature that refers to Moses in very exalted terms. And in one text, it, even seeing Moses as being seated on God's very throne. And then there are the parables of one Enoch, where this mysterious son of man figure sits on the throne of the Lord of glory himself and nations bow down to him. Kings bow down to him. He's given the task of judging the angels, or maybe Jesus could be divine like a, a deified emperor, like a Julius Caesar or uh, an Augustus who was thought to uh, ascend to the Olympian heights and become a divine being after death. Therefore, the early church, 
in light of Jesus's astounding claims about himself, in light of his resurrection, it was perfectly understandable that they regarded Jesus as a divine being. But divine in what sense? Because they were, on the one hand, constrained by Jewish monotheism, the belief that God is one and God is God of gods and king of kings. He presides over a celestial monarchy. I mean, we could even talk in terms of a monarchical monotheism where God, Yahweh, rules over lesser divine beings and angels and spirits and that type of thing. Where does Jesus as a divine being fit into that divine hierarchy? Where, where do we put him uh, among the angels, among spirits, or is he higher above them? Because on the other hand, Jesus is a divine agent, and yet he seems to be identified with God in unusually intense ways, even to the point he seems to be identified as God. And that's where the debate really begins, because the early church then spends the best part of 300 years trying to explain in what sense is Jesus a divine being? Where does he fit into this pyramid of divinity? What is the best scriptural language to use to describe Jesus's divinity? And how does that relate to the divinity of the Father? And then you've got the search for a grammar and language that is compelling, clear, and coherent. So for our Jewish Christians, for those part of the Jerusalem church and thereafter, Jesus was divine. He was aligned with God, with God's purposes and God's actions, maybe even with God's being. But in what sense? And how do you explain that in light of Jewish monotheism? In the earliest days of the Jerusalem church, it would seem that their belief in Jesus' resurrection forced them to go back and reread the Hebrew Bible, especially the Psalter, and to try and make sense of who Jesus was, how to understand his life, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his exaltation. And the book that had the most prominence and the most utility for doing that was the book of Psalms, because many of the Psalms are about a Davidic king, a person who's chosen by God, crowned, coronated, uh, begotten, and is going to be at the center of God's deliverance of Israel. In Jewish traditions, a consistent pattern emerges whereby God's kingly power and deliverance are manifested in an anointed Davidic king. This made the king somewhere between a human agent and a manifestation of Israel's national deity. The Israelite monarchy had rituals and rhetoric that could compete with the ruler cults of the Egyptian and Hellenistic world. This meant seeing the national king, Israel's king, uh, not just as a human being, but as a person in, in some sense, perhaps metaphorically, begotten of God, a manifestation of God's own kingly power. And it was this royal ideology that you find in the Psalms and in some cases in the prophets that provided the basis for the notion of a superhuman Messiah that was to become very prominent in Second Temple Judaism, particularly in messianic and apocalyptic texts. It is in the context of royal ideology and quasi-divine kingship that we find Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a royal enthronement psalm celebrating the divine installment, even the quasi-adoption of Israel's king. The notion that the king was a son of God was very common in the ancient Near East, and the language of begetting that we find in the psalm probably points to Egyptian influence. The psalm seems to reflect some kind of enthronement ceremony where the Israelite monarch was addressed by Yahweh as my son and called king by various vassals who were bowing down to him. In Jewish Christian appropriations, the application of Psalm 2 to Jesus was clear. The pagan nations, the Pontius Pilots, the Caesars, they may rage and howl against the Lord's anointed the Messiah, but Israel's God has acted with purpose and power. 
not only vindicating Jesus as the Messiah, but exalting him as his very son and promising to make his enemies his footstool and to give him an inheritance of nations. So you can see Psalm 2 was, for obvious reasons, very popular and very prominent in Jewish Christian circles. Then there is Psalm 110. This psalm is very significant. It's very significant for Jewish royal ideology of the king, and it's also very important for Jewish Christian messianism. Uh, this is a text where Yahweh invites Israel's king to share his very own throne, and the courtier around the king thereafter call him Lord. And this reflects the tradition of a king being a throne sharer with a deity. And this idea of sharing a throne with a deity, I mean, this, this is common. You find this in ancient Egypt. You find this in the religion and the royal ideologies of Greek and Hellenistic kingdoms. You find it throughout the Near East, and you also find it even in the Roman imperial cult as well, where you could have a image of the emperor being co-enthroned with Jupiter or Zeus or something along those lines. Psalm 110 indicates that in the royal ideology of ancient Israel, the king could be conceived as a throne sharer with Yahweh. And this implies co-rule, a form of vice regency. So the king is co-enthroned with the deity and, in a sense, shares in the sovereignty of the deity. The position at a deity's right hand is indicative not only of superlative status and honor, but it makes a remarkably close association between the deity and the royal servant. The theological significance of throne sharing is the equality that it presumes between those who share the throne. In Jewish Christianity, Psalm 110 was the default go-to text for explaining Jesus' post-Easter status and identity. This was the, the main way that the early church proclaimed who Jesus was after his death and resurrection. And it was significant for a number of reasons. It meant there had been a great reversal. Jesus had gone from being crucified like a bandit or a slave to co-enthroned with the creator of the universe. It meant he was a royal and priestly figure. He was the anointed one. He really was the Messiah. And it also implied a certain degree of divine agency and a certain degree of divine equality as well. So how did the early church see or imagine Jesus as divine? Well, largely in terms of Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, Jesus is the messianic king. He is divinely begotten and he is co-enthroned with Yahweh and shares thereafter in the orbit of divine sovereignty. Arguably, one of the most prominent titles for Jesus in early Christianity, in Jewish Christianity, is that he was the son of God. This is obviously indebted to the royal ideology we've just discussed, where Israel's king was a son of God. And, and this goes back to the covenant. If you look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, there you see God making a promise that David will always have a descendant upon the throne. God will be a father to him and the Davidite will be a son to him. And this becomes very important in subsequent literature. I mean, you see it in Psalm 2, Psalm 89, and various messianic and apocalyptic texts in the second temple period. But Jesus' divine sonship is more than being a royal figure. Jesus seems to have claimed a unique filial relationship with Israel's God. Now, the idea of calling God Father was certainly not unique to Jesus. You can find that in the Hebrew Bible. You can find that in Jewish literature. You can even find it in Greco-Roman literature. But Jesus seems to have conceived of his sonship in a very specific and very intensive way. He was God's special son, a special chosen one. He had a unique mission from God, a unique role 
from God, and he was the recipient of a unique revelation from God. That is why he prayed to God as father, and he invited his his disciples, his followers, also to address God as father. And this is why Paul, you know, writing to Gentile churches, he can tell Gentile Christians to also address God as Abba in that cry of intimacy. So Jesus was the son of God in a royal and messianic sense, but he also claimed to have a unique filial relationship with God. And that seems to be reflected in the early church's preaching and teaching about Jesus's divine sonship. He wasn't merely a son of God. He was the son of God. What is also significant is that seems to form a counterpart with the Roman imperial cult. Because in the propaganda of the emperor in ancient Rome, the emperor was often regarded as a son of God. For instance, Julius Caesar, he was regarded as having ascended into the heavens, having been deified, becoming a celestial entity. Julius Caesar was a god, which meant that his adopted heir, Augustus, was the son of a god. He was the son of the divine Augustus. So Jesus, as the son of God, has its own counterpart, its own rival, if you like, with the divine sonship of the Roman emperors. In addition to that, you can see that this emphasis on Jesus's divine sonship is not only pervasive, it's very early. One very important and primitive text is Romans chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. This seems to be something that is pre-Pauline. It's a a primitive piece of material. Uh, Maybe it's a fragment of a hymn, a creed, or just a well-known formula for describing Jesus. But it sets out Jesus as, on the one hand, in his earthly life, a, a son of David. But then, by virtue of the resurrection, he becomes the son of God in power. Now, note that his divine sonship does not begin with the resurrection. He's already the divine son by virtue of being the son of David. But his his divine sonship uh, comes into a new eschatological function with his exaltation. He's not just the Davidic or the Messianic son. He's now the heavenly and exalted son of God in power. And in other places like Acts 9, you can see people preaching that Jesus is the son of God, largely in this messianic sense, but also with echoes of his unique relationship with God. We also have some remarkable statements in Paul's letters where he says that God sent his son into the world, sent him to be you know, born under woman, sent him to die as a sacrifice for our sins or words to that effect. And this could imply that not only is Jesus himself pre-existent, but even his sonship is pre-existent, a mighty claim indeed. So it would seem for the early church, for Jewish Christianity, Jesus was not simply a son of God. He was the son of God. He was the messianic son. He had a unique relationship with Israel's God, and he was now the son of God in power, exalted and enthroned, a true divine regent sharing in the equality of God's rule. That brings us to the end of part one of the Christology of Jewish Christianity. Now, we've looked at several things. We've looked at the influence that Jesus himself had on the development of early Christology. We've touched upon the resurrection as well and how that indicated that Jesus was a divine being. But divine in what sense? It would seem that in search of an answer that the the early church, the first Christians, went straight to the book of Psalms and they looked at texts like Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 as a way of understanding who Jesus was. And the answer they came to was that he was a son of God. He was co-enthroned with Yahweh. And this is why they proclaimed him as the son of God. Uh, On the one hand, this meant that he was a Davidic king. He was the Messiah, but he was more than that. He had a unique relationship with God. He was the chosen one. He was Israel's deliverer, and he is the one through whom God would put all things to right. That's what we've covered this week 
Uh, next time, we're going to look at some other things. We're going to look at some other Christological titles. We're going to look at Jesus as Messiah and Lord. And we're also going to look at Jesus as the bearer and the dispenser of the Holy Spirit. All that and more to come in the next episode. Until then, uh, please hit the subscribe button, uh, like, share, leave a review on iTunes. That all helps the show and the channel. So till next time, God bless you. Take care. And we'll see what happens when we get into our next episode about the Christology of Jewish Christianity.